ICFRC hosts community programs to address topics of international interest. We thank our members, volunteers, and interns for making these forums possible since 1983. Wait for it. That was a year that Korean Airlines 007, with 269 aboard, was shot down without warning by the Soviet Union. I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's international programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization. We thank them for their financial support. And we thank today's special sponsors, Toyota of Iowa City and Physicians for Social Responsibility. We also thank City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4 or 118-2 and the UI Library's digital archives. Over 220 ICFRC podcasts can now be found on iTunes. Thanks, David, and thanks especially to everybody for coming out on this beautiful day. Never let it be said that Iowans are wimps. Um, I am so delighted to introduce my new friend, Keith Som, to the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council today. He is a man of many talents. Um, he's a longtime manager of the Sunset House in Grand Cayman. Can you imagine being here versus the Grand Cayman? He is an accomplished driver, diver, a strategist, a hotelier, and marketer, and beyond that, a real um, advocate for uh, the corals. Through his unique experiences, he's become a board member of the Diving Equipment and Marketing Association and Cayman Islands Tourism Association. He was nicknamed, um, no, named Diver of the Year in 2015. Huh? Nicknamed <laughs> by Beneath the Sea for his role in promoting scuba recreation and training and is also the co-founder, most importantly for today, of Force Blue a couple of years ago. Force Blue is the only nonprofit organization in the world right now that provides mission therapy for former combat divers, individuals in whom governments have trained as underwater special operators. They go on missions together to conserve and restore the underwater ecosystem by doing things like installing coral farms in the Cayman Islands and uh, looking at uh, what's going on. Uh, around the keys here in the United States. And without um, taking any of his fire, because he's a much better speaker, I, I welcome uh, Keith Shaw and hope you join me in welcoming as well. Thank you very much. Um, very honored to be here. I uh, want to thank Mickey, Mark Dusecki for bringing me up here from Toyota. Um, like I said, it, it's, it's an honor to be up here and um, just, I just want this one thing that for you guys to really know. Every time you see the snow out there, just know you're not going to have a hurricane hit any time and like wipe out Iowa City. So there's, there's advantages to the snow. Um, as Mickey said, for uh, 22 years, I was general manager of a resort in the Cayman Islands. Since then, I actually have moved back to the United States. I live in a little podunk town in Fountain Inn, South Carolina very much like Mayberry RFD, but uh, it's kind of back, back to the roots. So uh, I enjoy that very, very much. Um, on to Force Blue. Let me start off kind of like where we're at right now, or just this was just a couple months ago. Maybe you've seen it on the news. And then I'm going to go back to the beginning for you guys here. So you got to meet my other two co-founders, uh, Jim Ritterhoff and, of course, Rudy Reyes. Now, kind of like how this all began. And um, Jim was coming down to Cayman uh, with his daughter, a little father-daughter trip uh, for her birthday in the summer of 2015. He runs into Rudy, who he had met several years earlier uh, with HBO. Jim was in advertising. Rudy, of course, was a recon Marine. 
Um, he ran into Rudy uh, by way of when it, Rudy was working with HBO on the HBO series Generation Kill. If you go back to that, if you've ever seen it, Rudy actually portrays himself in that series. Um, one of the, the only guy in, in the entire thing that actually portrays himself. But he runs into Rudy there in New York City, and he is a mess. I mean, he had just gotten out of um, rehab, um, and you could just tell in his eyes, just not everything was clicking together. And here is a very, very proud Marine that's just in the weeds. And Jim goes, come to Cayman, go diving with us. He goes, I, he goes, I can't, I just can't. He get, Jim goes, look, I'll pay for your flight. Let me make a phone call. Jim calls me. I said, bring him down. I'll pay for his meals. I'll put him up the hotel. We'll take him diving. We'll get his mind off. We'll try to set it straight. So Rudy comes down. He's been a recon Marine for over 17 years. 13 of those years, he's been a combat diver. He actually did have a certifying agency C card, a PADI C card. Is there any scuba divers in the audience? One, two, three. Okay, cool. So he had, he had a Patty certifying card. So we, we go out, and just off Sunset House is a beautiful shore dive, just steps off the resort. We go out there, and it's like, where in the hell did Rudy go? I mean, he's like shooting all over the place. I mean, he's all over the reef. He's up. He's down. He's, he's just going crazy. And I'm like, what in the hell, you know, is going on with this guy? So we pop back up. <laughs> And Rudy's blown away because he saw this fish. All right? I'm like, Rudy, that's, that's a mutton snapper. You know, it's like we got lots of those down there. That's not like a, you know, special find. He goes, I know. He goes, I said, don't tell me you've never seen a fish. He goes, I've never seen a fish underwater. So we came back up, rinsed our gear, sitting at the bar. So then we start talking about his military diving career. His military diving career for those 13 years, we either jumping out of helicopters about two and a half miles away with a team of six hopping in a Zodiac and rowing into within two and a half miles and infiltrating down underwater, 20 feet down on a rebreather, pushing 250 pounds of gear as fast and as hard as they could to either do one of three things, either go blow something up, go rescue someone, or we're on a mission to kill. And that was his entire military diving career. There wasn't no lurking around going, oh, look at the angelfish, you know? I mean, it was all done at two o'clock in the morning with zero moon. Sometime they were jumping out of, uh, they were doing halo diving where they're out jumping out of uh, aircraft at 14,000 feet before they come down. But that was his military career as a diver and we saw like a light come on Rudy. I mean, he's like really inspired with all the life that he's missed down there for 13 years. So at the same time, and it's not why I'm not in Cayman anymore, but I was fighting the Cayman Islands government because in their infinite wisdom, they want to tear up 17 acres of coral reef to put in a cruise birthing facility. They've had cruise tourism down there for years and years, and they tender everyone in, you know. They do not have a cruise berth. So I couldn't get it, you know, we're only one mile down away, and I was not gonna let that happen on my watch that someone tears up 17 acres of coral reef, and then the residual blowback of every time a ship and its propellers come in, right? It would just silt out everything for miles around there. And it, it's a delicate reef system. We all know that. So I had been fighting the government. Rudy and I were talking about that. Rudy goes, I know some guys that can come help us. And I'm like, no, Rudy, we don't need to come in, kill someone, do anything like that. We, we just don't need that, you know? So Jim's like listening to both of us going back and forth. And he goes, well, maybe, maybe we can do something. And then um, we talked to Rudy about, this is the same group of people that are killing themselves 22 a day. Whether you know it or not, these special op veterans, a lot of the veterans throughout the world, 
like walking out that door, will stick a gun in their mouth and blow their brains out. It's that simple. They've had, you know, weapons pointed at them all the time in their military career. It's just a way out. Like I said, it's like going out that door versus going out that door, which, which, which one they decide to take. And we got talking about that because that's why Rudy was in such a bad way. Four of his friends had just committed suicide. Four team members had committed suicide. And it's like, Rudy, what's the deal? Is it that what you guys have done? He goes, oh, hell no. We were trained for that. It's not what we've done. It's not what we've seen. It's not what a lot of people think. It's coming back and not having a mission, coming back and not having a sense of purpose, coming back and not fitting into society the way that we've been trained for the last 15 to 20 years. So it's like, wow. So then that's when Jim chimed in. He goes, well, now I really know what I think we could do. It's like, let's give you guys a new mission. Let's give you a positive mission. You know, these guys, the United States government has spent over a million dollars for each one of these military divers on their education. And when they get done service, what do they do? They go out, work at Walmart, go work at, you know, whatever. And like one of the guys said, you could give me a job in a cubicle and pay me six figures a year. And he goes, that's lethal. He goes, I mean, it's lethal. Because they're not in that team environment. They're not working together for a, for a, a solid purpose. So... We put our heads together and we kind of formulated Force Blue that afternoon in a bar in the Cayman Islands. So to make this all, you know, we said we were going to become a 501c3. We we're going to do all these things that a non-for-profit should do. And I go, wait a minute, this might not even work. You know, we're going to have, and then this is, this is the structure of it. We put these guys through a two-week military-style school that myself and another scientist put together, okay? It's like an A school back in the military. We bring these guys in teams of six, and we have the brightest minds, scientific minds, in the marine environment to come down and lecture these guys on the environment, the fish life, the threats, everything like that that we are all pretty much accustomed to. And then at the end of those two weeks, I mean, you gotta remember, here's guys that have never seen a fish before underwater, and they've been diving for 13 years. At the end of two weeks, what my goal was, or what our goal was, was that they would see the coral reefs and the marine environment as a community under threat that, that can't protect itself. And this is what these men and women do throughout their military career, was to protect communities that cannot protect themselves. Uh, kind of get, get going here. Um, so anyway, um, what we're, we're a little bit different than most therapy programs. Um, we are mission therapy. There's a lot of therapy programs that uses scuba diving, horseback riding, um, fishing, fly fishing, uh, a lot of military to get the guys back together so they're back in their same environment again. The problem is, whether it's three days, five days, something like that, there's always Sunday night and everyone goes, bye-bye, we'll see ya. And a lot of times they drop right back down harder than where they were when they came into the program. Where we're different is that we bring these guys in and they have to give us a commitment that they will basically give us at least six weeks out of the year that they're gonna go out and do missions. And a lot of these guys have given us a heck of a lot more than that um, because they see the value in it. So we bring them up in teams of six, just like they're used to. We run them through that school. And then we also have a PTSD counselor and um, a, a, a um, outside class that they are required to go through. Uh, 
And actually, when we did Team One down in Cayman, we hit a snag halfway through because all of a sudden we opened these guys up and it was, they were like a mess. You know, we hadn't expected that. So we actually canceled a day, brought in this PTSD counselor and talked these guys through all this because it was like uh, cracking away at a shell and opening these guys up. So we hadn't anticipated that. So for starting a non-for-profit, we did everything ass backwards. You know, most people spend years and years building the nonprofit. It's like, nah, we're going to do it, and then we'll think about building the nonprofit part if we see that it's going to work. Because um, like I said, during this school, I wasn't too sure on Tuesday night we might have a, someone dead, right? <laughs> I mean, we got these ultra-far left, submarine scientists from Oregon State University coming down and telling this far right recon marine navy seal what to do and how we're going to do it I'm like this might not pan out it all looks good on paper but it might it might not work out um and I hope everyone can come tonight to actually see the documentary that we did put together and the documentary was nothing more than a proof of concept video and um, documenting if we did have a murder on night two or something like that, we had it all on film. So um, if you can come tonight, please do. Uh, so anyway, they're like a reserve unit. They deploy. We actually do employ these guys. When they go out working for us, we pay them a contractor rate. As If, if anyone's seen the uh, 13 hours of those contractors in Benghazi, or when they go out and do contracting work back in Syria or Africa, wherever, wherever they're at, we pay them the same rate that they would make as a government contractor. We pay them per diem, we pay their travel, we pay straight up um, to get put these guys to work. And we have different missions, and as part of my position as programming director is to make sure that these guys have positive missions that they can go do. They still continue with the PTSD counseling. They have to go to at least this camp at least once a year. It's a six day uh, camp. And then they also have to do this uh, public outreach. So one of the cool byproducts out of all this, uh, and we hadn't thought about it because we had anticipated on these guys, uh, you know, healing themselves, healing the planet, we didn't stop and think about the byproduct that we were going to get. Now, Force Blue was actually founded in the summer of 2016. Remember that date, all right, that time period. Because what was going on in the summer of 2016? We had a presidential election coming along, right? Where no one would agree if you were on this side it didn't matter if you kind of sort of agree, you would not admit that you would agree to it. I mean, it was like split apart as far left, as, as far left and far right as you could get, right? Well, here we're like trying to kumbaya and we're gonna put everyone together and come up with this program. So, um, as you can read up there, it's a, it's a our mission is to unite the community of special operations combat with the world of the underwater environment for the betterment of both, okay? And it really does help these guys. We have core values, just like what we, like you have in the military. And um, these guys are, are, when they buy into it, they do not want to, they don't like hearing a lot of answers that we have to give them, especially when it comes from the political side or this and that. But back real quick on the byproduct that we came up with. We have a voice now that is different than every other voice out there. It's like if everyone's environmentalist and they want to, we want to go hear Sylvia Earle speak tonight. Doc, everyone know who Dr. Sylvia Earle is? The marine biologist, very famous woman, marine biologist. Everyone would believe what she's going to have to say. One of the first things that happened with Rudy was he attended the SHOT Show, which is a the latest and greatest military advancements, weaponry, 
this and that in Las Vegas every year. He runs into this gal by the name of Tommy Laren. If you don't know who she is, she's ultra far right, you know, um, non-believer in global warming, you know, blonde Texan, yeehaw, you know. And uh, she runs into Rudy and she's like, oh, come on my television show. Come on my television show. Of course, you know, Rudy's like strapping Rudy, right? So he goes on. She goes, so what are you up to? And all of a sudden, Rudy goes on for 20 minutes about protecting coral reefs and really stop and thinking about using single-use plastic and really stop and thinking about this. And all of a sudden, here's the, uh, the uh, global warming gal that's like, are you kidding me? All of a sudden, she goes, huh, maybe we should think about that. Well, her audience is not the left, the tree-hugging, fish-hugging, coral-hugging people. These are ultra-right military people that we're now reaching out to and talking to. So this is why also I've spent eight occasions on Capitol Hill this past summer, speaking with different groups like Oceana, the Nature Conservancy, the Ocean Conservancy, because politicians get tired of hearing the same old tree huggers saying the same thing over and over. Now, all of a sudden, you take a Navy SEAL with you, and you sit down there in front of a congressman. All of a sudden, they start paying attention and listening because it's a different voice talking. So that was a very, very cool byproduct. And then, of course, we tied all these guys together. Um, Rudy there with Jeff Reeves, who's a uh, Navy SEAL. And Roger, back there in the background, he's an Air Force pararescue man. He's actually spent 13 years as a recon marine um, cadre, taught Rudy, was like their drill sergeant throughout the whole thing. And then the Marines were going to give him a desk job, and he said, screw you. And he basically left the Marines, joined the Air Force, and he's a, one of the highest decorated PJs or pararescue jumpers in the Air Force and just retired last year. But when this guy speaks, people listen, and it's very cool. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to give you a little hint of the kind of like a trailer we put together of tonight's documentary. The ocean is really the last frontier. It's the largest thing on the planet. It makes the oxygen that we breathe, yet it's so easy for us to ignore. Coral reefs in particular are like the rainforests of the underwater world, and we're seeing corals die off in many parts of the world. We put together a program that brought together the world of these special operations combat divers and the world of coral reef conservation and marine scientists. We have a chance with Force Blue to actually make a difference. We have aptitude and ability, we have discipline and knowledge. But purpose is the keystone that holds it together. Their intelligence is really high, their processing speed is very fast. They always need the next thing, the next thing. They're action oriented. You don't really intellectually comprehend sharks, but they're not as dangerous as they've been made out to be. There was such a distinct parallel between that and combat veterans. Remember, we're servicemen. We're starving. Like these animals keep moving to process that air and to keep on the hunt. That's what we need to do with service. The more dangerous or the more honorable, the better. That's Force Blue. If you take this energy, take a group of men who are willing to hear gunshots and run towards them to serve a larger purpose, converting now that service into a new cause, I've noticed that light come back on. You're not just going to dive and have fun. You're going now with a purpose, you're going on the mission, and that's, that's exciting. Great stuff down here. Magical. I'm very thankful to see what's at stake today, places like this. This sets the stage for why we're doing what we're doing. Being in the ocean forces perspective, you know, it's like you are passively engaged in this other world. I think that that is the most healing thing on Earth. Programs like Force Blue is that grace to attempt to allow us the perspective to move forward. Why not be a weapon of mass construction? Why not go out and rebuild coral reefs? I can't see the things that happened as a result of my actions in Iraq, but I can see the coral flourish. What I miss the most is meaning. Like whatever I'm doing has meaning for the greater good. These veterans, they're such an amazing new voice to the environmental community. People are going to listen to these Captain Americas about saving the environment. 
It's amazing how passionate everyone is, both sides, from the ecology side to the veteran side. This represents our little blue planet, the only one we have. One team, one fight. Ah! My brothers and sisters that are involved here in Force Blue are modeling a transition, a mission of hope and being a force of good and change in the oceans. I'm not done serving. I don't know if there's such a thing. That's just a little snippet of, uh, if you can come out tonight, this 40-minute documentary that we put together. And uh, as I said, it was um, kind of a proof of concept. So the guys we had come down to actually do the filming, they interviewed absolutely everyone from all the scientists that came down, the veterans, the staff, people at the hotel, people on the island that were associated with us, underwater photographers that were going down and shooting a lot of this stuff. They interviewed them at the very beginning and then at, at the end of the two weeks. And you will see a huge transformation in not just the team, but the scientists as well. So anyway, we got six guys. We um, proved that this is gonna work. Now what do we do, right? So this is, that was in the spring of 2017. So we've got everything in place. Now we need a program, now we need a mission. Well, thankfully for us, terrible for the people of the Florida Keys and people in Puerto Rico, Hurricane Irma hit. And if you've never experienced a hurricane, you will actually sit there and have PTSD yourself you'll sit there and go, what the hell just happened? Everything that I just had is gone. You'll see people, like I lived through several, or was witnessed several hurricanes down in the Cayman Islands. You'll see people walking around in the days for months, not knowing what the hell's going on with their lives. So I reached out to some of our scientists and our key people that taught these guys coral restoration toward the end of their two weeks and go, hey, can we come and help? And one of the responses was from this coral restoration expert just said, Keith, it's all gone. It's all gone. You don't understand. There's nothing for us to fix. And she was in that state of shock. So we turned around and I said, Patty, it's not all gone. We will be there for you. And we came down and we ended up restoring and doing a lot. Um, and even brought in and rescued. We were working with NOAA at the time. We got a grant from the Ocean Conservancy to get our guys down there, and we worked with them. Remember, we're not a full-blown non-for-profit yet, right? So we didn't have protocols. So NOAA, as a government agency, they have protocols. So when it came down to Archie, and Archie was this Year, uh, 500 year, I think, or 500 year old pillar coral that had been blown off the top of the reef down into this crevice about 25 feet down. Noah said, We can't do anything about it. I was like, What do you mean? And our guys, like I said, they took offense that you, what do you mean we can't do anything about it? You know, they got mad and they go, We can't lift anything that heavy. <laughs> and our guys go, We can. So it's like, how many lift bags you got? We took every lift bag that Noah had on their ship, went down there, and in the matter of about 10 minutes, they had this thing rigged up, brought it back up into place. Someone popped up and said, somebody mix up about 25 gallons of concrete, brought it over, put the concrete down, put Archie back in place, and all of a sudden, just life started coming back into it. We get back up on the ship, Everyone's crying, bawling their eyes out. Like, oh crap, what do we do now? And they said, you don't understand. You just saved the T-Rex of the Florida Keys. This is like an iconic piece of pillar coral that's endangered throughout all the Florida Keys and we brought it back. And this gal, we're still working for her right now down there in the Florida Keys. She's been studying Archie that's how I found out he had a name. It had a name. Um, 
for over the last 30 years. This has been her project, is studying this pillar coral. So it was very, very, that's when the lights really came on to NOAA, to a lot of government agencies that we can do a lot more than what, and our work ethics are completely different than what the rest of them. So then all of a sudden Hurricane Maria followed right back up. NOAA goes, you guys need to come down to Puerto Rico. So the Nature Conservancy, the OSHA Conservancy again, wrote us grants as, long, as well as uh, NIFWIF. Um, they sent us money to get our guys to go back down there and work along several other people, putting the reefs back together, especially in Puerto Rico on the northeast side. So we were there for over a month. The first time then we were deployed again for about a three month period with about four of our guys. They just lived out there, lived on boats. That's another thing, we don't have to have plush hotels. Our guys are used to living in a tent out in the middle of a desert. They really don't get that bent out of shape if you know the shampoo's not in the little bottles, right? <laughs> so, and that, like talking about their, their mentality, all right, they don't know anything about we're gonna get this after lunch or we're gonna get it tomorrow. It's like, you don't have that in the military. If you're out in the middle of the Afghanistan, it's like, ah, time out, you know, we'll, we'll get back and we'll shoot at you tomorrow. It's constant going on. And that's this mentality in these guys' names. We were given a four-day project to do with the Coral uh, Restoration Foundation on building these coral trees that we were, to, we were gonna rebuild their coral farm in the Florida Keys. And um, they said, that, that'll get you four days. Well, after lunch, our guys come back and go, now what? We literally got four days worth of work done in about six hours. And they were blown away. But I mean, their, their skill level is just, you know, to get to it, you know, it's uh, completely different. So, like I said, our continued success uh, over the last few years, um, we've built these powerful partnerships with NOAA, um, the Ocean Conservancy, Oceana, all these others that you see over there on the side. We've done three deployments, actually. This is an older slide, we're actually on one right now. We transplanted over 6,000 corals, put over 6,000 corals back in place in those three uh, uh, deployments back there. We've made, like I said, we made eight trips to Capitol Hill over the winter. And uh, we ended up in August of last year, trained team two. And it all comes down to, to money, right? It costs us about $150,000 for this two week training program, paying for all the scientists to come down, paying for the accommodations, paying for, you know. Um, we were gonna take it back to Cayman where our, I had a little bit of control over it at, at that time, but we had met the Florida Department of Environmental Protection in one of our trips to Washington, D.C. that heard us speak. And they wanted to have a meeting with us. And at that time, um, they really didn't know what they wanted us to do. They just know, knew that we were gonna do it for them. We're gonna get into that a little bit of what we're actually doing. But the news stories, like you said, CBS, it's been around the world of what we're accomplishing and what we're doing. You might have noticed the accent of John Schleyer, uh, our British Royal Commando. We're not just pigeonholed to having United States Special Forces divers. We actually have two British Royal Commandos, and there's a lot of other international from Israel to Australia to Canada, Germany, Brazil, have all shown interest wanting us to come down and do the program there with their vets or have them come up and join our teams. They just see that much value in it. And I gave this, I gave a presentation in Canada. Um, if you think our vets get treated badly here in the United States, you should hear what the people in Canada say about their government's treatment of their vets in, in Canada. It's uh, it was kind of an eye-opening uh, experience. So team two, we changed it from down in Cayman. We put it and we had the actual team two two-week school in Flo Key Largo uh, because we knew we were going to 
um, dedicate um, the work in the Florida Keys, we decided to train these guys straight up. So team one, we actually call team fluff. Team two is team stuff um, because those Team one's all in the videos and the documentary and this and that, so they're like Hollywood, and the guys on team two are the ones actually doing all the work right now. <laughs> so we have uh, very much in the early part, or later part of this year, it's 2019 already, um, we're gonna develop team three. We know we cannot train every special forces guy or every military guy that needs help. We understand that. And we know we're not gonna be able to fix every ocean throughout the world. But as long as we can be role models and set examples, not only for our veteran community, but for um, both sides of the aisle, you know, we, we can make a difference here. So after that, we got this. In October 2017, just weeks after Hurricane Irma ravaged South Florida and the Florida Keys, Force Blue sent a team of divers to assist NOAA in restoring the region's badly damaged coral reefs. This August, Force Blue returned to Florida for two weeks of intense training aimed at readying a new team to enter the fight. At the end of its training deployment, Force Blue announced plans to move all operations to the Florida Keys for the next three years to assist the state in its ongoing battle to rescue, restore, and preserve the critically threatened Florida Coral Reef Tract. Under the banner, Project Protect, Force Blue veterans will be helping to spearhead the single largest coral reef rescue attempt ever mounted. We are Force Blue. A team of special operations veterans. And military trained combat divers. And now we're fighting for our oceans. Visit forcebluteam.org. Learn how you can be part of this historic mission. Join the fight. We are Force Blue. Help us. Help vets. Help the planet. One team, one, one fight. So this is what we're doing right now. And I'll kind of go through this. But a lot of people, when they think about the situation in Florida, they think about the red tide, and they think about Big Sugar, and they think about Lake Okeechobee and the runoff, and all the problems that they're having, right? I mean, everyone's seen that on the news. Everyone can relate to the dead manatee in the water and the fish along the beach that is all dead. What a lot of people don't understand and realize that there is a serious coral disease happening down through the Florida Keys. And you can see the time frame right here, okay? Well, guess, guess what's right here, where this all started? Biscayne Bay. What did they do five years ago in Biscayne Bay? They dredged the bay up to make it easier for ships to go through, larger ships, larger cruise ships, larger that. But what happened was they brought out a monster they brought out a pathogen that lied deep below, that had been sitting there nice and fine, and dredged it up, and now all of a sudden it took out, went to the north by the ocean current, and then in the Keys there's a counter current that goes down real close to the Keys itself. And you can see the timeline as it's going down. There's over 40 universities and 40, um, different groups from the CDC all the way down through University of Wisconsin, Moat Marine, Nova Southeastern, working on this project. To this day, they cannot identify the pathogen. All they know is, is that it attacks some of the biggest building corals of a coral reef out there. A lot of people put think about, you know, the Elkhorn coral or the Staghorn coral that's like very susceptible to bleaching events. When the water gets too hot, those corals white out and die. They don't really die, because they, they do actually come back years later. But here's kinda, and this is one of the things that really honked off our guys, all right? Over here on the side, talks about how many jobs that the, that the Keys uh, provide, which is 70,000 jobs, equaling 6.4 billion in sales and income annually. 
Uh, 58% of all jobs are tied to the Florida Keys, generating 2.36 billion in sales and income annually. Do you know how much the state of Florida put towards the taking care of this coral disease? One million dollars. And that goes to like for the work that we're doing, the work that Nova Southeastern, all those four, the CDC, everyone that's working on this, they put, I'm telling you, our guys got honked off. It's like, how in the hell can you do that? You know, this is serious. Um, plus the fact, remember Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria? The reefs are a huge protector of, of the inland. It stops and throttles the, the big waves coming in from the storms. So that's why it's such an importance to keep these reefs alive. It uh, brings in. So here's what, here's what the threat is. We call it Skittles. Um, it's a stony coral tissue loss disease. Again, we don't know what the pathogen is. Um, but those 22 corals that you see on the side, a lot of them are on the endangered species list already. That is what it's being affected. It's not the Elkhorn coral. It's funny, it's the Elkhorn, the Staghorn coral are actually immune to this. But these reef building corals are the ones that catch this disease. And it literally starts out with a lesion about the size of this, all right? If our guys or the scientists see a lesion this big, within three months, that coral structure will be dead. You can see the time frame here. This was January 5th. You can just see the lesion right down here. And this coral right here, I'm not going to lie to you, it's only this big, OK? January 5th, January 19th, February 1st, it's already going on to the back side of it. That's how fast this reacts. And meanwhile, it just keeps on marching down the Florida reef track. Now, that doesn't sound bad, right? That little coral this big dies in a three-month period. The problem is when we ran across what we called Big Mama, one of the largest known colonies of mountainous star coral in the Florida Keys. All right, this thing's... They, the scientists guesstimate it's over 330 years old in itself. It's huge, all right? It survived the Industrial Revolution, numerous hurricanes, many of the stresses associated with rapid suburb, um, urbanization, you know, because you got all the fertilizers going out in the water. You got all this other stuff that's happening. It died in a matter of three to four months after contracting this Skittles. And it's not coming back like a bleaching event. It's dead. Now, one of the things they're tasking us with, and it's a big uproar between all this 40 different groups that are out there, they want to start replanning and doing the restoration work after this so the reef system comes back. The problem is there's a lot of people that sit there and believe that everything that we go to do to restore stuff would be like throwing kindling on a fire. The pathogen will turn around and go back and consume what we just plant. It's fresh growth. So it's still up in the air. But I got to tell you, from being an underwater diver for, well, I don't know, 40 some years, and not to touch coral, not to kick coral, no gloves, you know, rubbing the coral in this and that. It's kind of hard to take a right angle grinder and start grinding on a coral. But that's exactly what we do. We basically make a fire break. Uh, you can see the right angle coral around there, up there. It's kind of it's kind of hard to see, and I apologize for this. But what we do is go around the lesion, and we cut in a groove like a circle all the way around the lesion. Now, you got to remember, the live part of the coral is just the top. It's like the skin. Everything down below is really just the skeleton portion of it. It's not really living. We, we do is go in, and then we either put in an epoxy, fill it back in with an epoxy with either a sodium hypochlorite solution. So it's got like putting in a very, very strong bleach around there to try to stop the pathogen. Or there's certain areas that we actually go in and we mix the epoxy with amoxicillin. 
And in certain areas, the amoxicillin works a heck of a lot better than the bleach. And, um, and it works a lot faster. But up in the upper keys, the, the, um, the um, bleach works better. So the numbers are here. We've got over 30,000 military trained combat divers in the US alone. We've had queries from all those other uh, destinations. So there's no shortage of men and women to actually get this done. These are all the reefs under, under stress throughout the world. So there's no shortage of reefs that we can't go out and help protect. All right? Um, our biggest challenge lies in convincing others of what we see. All right? And this goes right back from what we said from the very beginning when we started this in 2016. And it's like one of the things, this was like one of the quotes I did. It's like, I don't give a crap if you get in the boat from the left side or if you get in from the right side. We're all getting on the same boat together and we're going to get this done. You know what I mean? So anyway, we're all on that same boat. So with that, thank you very much. Hope that helps. Anyway, our first question's an interesting one. Um, uh, he, the person, it could be a she, um, imagines that there is some cognitive dissonance for some of the veterans um, as their far right climate denial may be challenged. How do you handle different conversations around climate change? These guys in that two week school, it didn't matter what they came in with. After that two weeks, they're a completely different person. They completely buy in to what's affecting the coral reefs. I mean, you got to remember, they never seen what they were affecting. They just used it as a point to go from point A to point B and used it as a highway. They fully understand now, and that's the cool thing. We're actually doing three PSAs for another non-for-profit group, our, our guys are. And one's about plastics, one's about uh, sustainable fish, and one's about sunscreens and suntan lotions. But the thing is, our guys aren't preaching out to like everyone else out there. It's going out on military.com and all these military sites that mount up to about 30 million people as their emailing list. So our guys fully buy into now of what really is affecting the planet. So that's why there's such great speakers for the environment now. Does that answer uh, speaking of, of climate change, um, other people would like to know, uh, from your uh, experience, your long experience in the dive community, how has climate change um, affected uh, the coral reefs that you're familiar with? When I first went down to Grand Cayman, it was 1979, and I could tell you right now, the reef system today doesn't look anything like it did then. Um, you've got issues not only with the global warming and the acidification going on, but you just got, you look how that island has changed, or you look how things have changed. I mean, even up here and dumping stuff into the uh, Iowa River, people, you know, they build all these brand new resorts, big resorts, and uh, got to have green grass, right? So let's just fertilize the crap out of it. And then when, as soon as the rain comes in, guess where all the fertilizers go? Out into the water. You know, a lot of these islands throughout the Caribbean still do not have sanitation departments. They still use cesspools and have deep wells, and that's where it goes out. It just permeates out through the, uh, through the limestone structures of the islands. So um, by far, and that's one of the things with the guys, um, and you'll see tonight, we actually take them from Grand Cayman and we take them over to Little Cayman to like give them a taste of like a, a much better reef than what Grand Cayman can offer. It's like Grand Cayman some 40 years ago because they could go out there and Coralville Lake out here and they'd think it's cool. But I mean, so we had to show them how things have changed over the years. And then when we brought them back, took them to the absolutely crappiest reef I could find in Grand Cayman and, and just basically sell them that this used to look very much like where you just came from in Little Cayman, and it's up to you to protect it. So it's, it's changed dramatically over the years, and, and that's it's very, very unfortunate, very unfortunate. 
Somebody in here is an occupational health uh, person and has the same sort of question I had earlier, and that was because I didn't understand what they're actually doing. How do you mitigate the risk of decompression sickness? So the teams, when they do go down so many respective dives, how does it affect their health? How do you take care of them? So one of the things that we wanted to do, because a lot of these guys have used in their military career rebreathers, right? So whether they're breathing pretty much a very high concentration of oxygen, or if they're staying above 20 feet, they'll be breathing 100% oxygen. Um, but a lot of the work that we're doing is between 35 and 60 feet. A lot of these coral reefs are not very, very deep, so they don't have the nitrogen buildup in them. Um, we do have, now, now that we're legit, we do have protocols now, I got a whole manual. We have a diving control board, diving safety board, a diving safety officer out there on every dive. Every dive that we do is pre-planned, pre-checked. Um, so it's very, very, these guys are very safe. And we've, uh, you asked earlier, I mean, last week we were averaging five dives a day and they were spending about, um, you know, an hour, hour and a half on each dive down there, but they have the proper surface interval and switching things around. So um, we knock on wood, we haven't had any problems, but that's one of our main concerns and, and um, we don't intend for these guys to get into trouble, so. Um, actually, this is my own personal question. Oh, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it is so exciting that you have been able to take the skills that us taxpayers have paid for the military to train all of them. I am well aware that the military itself is aware of the dangers of the changing climate. Do you feel any shift at all within our military seeing how these guys are committed to doing the right thing to kind of slowly coming around to seeing more of their mission being saving the planet. Could you just kind of talk a little bit about that from a military perspective? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the people we meet on the Hill, and um, I had the pleasure, uh, Angela and myself, we went to the State Department, and um, last year was the International Year of the Reef. Don't know if you know that or not, but we were invited to the State Department there in Washington, D.C., to actually give a talk and give a, uh, they made it sound like we were one of many that were there. It ended up we were the only people actually presenting at this presentation um, to all these dignitaries of all these different countries, from Mexico to Japan to this and that, and speaking about um, what our guys do. In that room were also a lot of the admirals, Admiral Gallaudet, who's over the, you know, NOAA and the, the Commerce Department. Our guys, like I said, they can relate, the military can relate to our guys where they couldn't relate to Dr. Scott Heppel or Sylvia Earle or Guy Harvey or, you know, people in the scientific community. But if our guys are in there talking to them and talking to them on their level, they start to get it, and that's why we're in such high demand with some of those other organizations now, because we do get to preach and talk of what's going on to that different audience in Washington, D.C. So we, we are making a difference there. Um, they were getting ready to um, cut back on NOAA's uh, budget, and we went in there and spoke on behalf of NOAA, and they not only um, kept their budget, but they doubled the amount of money going to NOAA for next year, for this year, sorry, 2019. So our guys are, you know, they're listening to our guys. So we're going to conclude our program, and we'll give a big thanks to Keith Sam for his presentation. I also want to thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honor Program, Honors Program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization. Uh, we thank today's special sponsors, Toyota of Iowa City and Physicians for Social Responsibility, and we thank City Channel 4 for making our programs available for our viewing audiences. And Keith, as a small token of our appreciation, we'd like to present you with our coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. <laughs> it's pretty exciting. Okay. We are adjourned.
Thank you. Thank you very much.